Welcome to Strike a Chord, Eureka Ensemble's official live podcast, where we take a deep dive into important issues facing our community, the latest current in the classical music world, and how music can strike the right chord in engaging with those issues. Featuring hosts Andres Ballesteros, Brittany Alsi, and I'm Christo Kondakchi. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoy. We're live. What a new experience. <laughs> it's loading. Is it? Because it says it's we're best. live. Oh, it says we're now streaming live. Yeah. That's what I see as well. Ooh. <laughs> Good Fun. evening, everybody. Welcome to Eureka's podcast, Strike a Chord, with our executive director, Andres, our assistant conductor, Brittany, and my name is Christo. I'm the artistic director and co-founder. Uh, we, we thought we'd start tonight with just introducing each other and our lives and all the terrible parts of our lives. <laughs> and all the great parts of our lives. Yeah, that got us into that. music. Yeah, And since this is an experiment, um, <clears throat> we thought we'd start with the chord of the week that I think Andres or Brittany will play. Brittany, what is the yeah. chord of the week? Yeah, set the mood for us. It's an A diminished chord. Ooh. I don't know if y'all can hear that. <laughs> really. Do it again. Do it again. Ooh. <laughs> I feel like the the hyenas in the Lion King when they're like Mufasa. Yes. <laughs> Say it again. Say it again. <laughs> well, I actually I, like so, the mood too. Brittany, since you've chosen our chord of the week, why A diminished and how did you get into music and why are you here right now? Huh, okay, well, why A diminished? I don't know, I was thinking of a seventh chord, but also the angle that I have to my piano isn't the greatest. So, you know, diminished kind of gives you a similar, but just more crunchy feel and sound to that. You might say um, you have a diminished she... reach over to the piano. Uh-huh. Uh, just, just a bit. Just a bit. Oh, oh boy. Uh, but anyway, how did I get into music in general or just like how we are in music today? Well, why conducting? I, oh, why yeah, conducting? wand waving. Curious. Yes. Uh, yes. I love waving the wand. It's, it's a great time. I'm really missing it in this time right now. Um, but why? Well, like when I was in high school, I got the chance to be the drum major of my marching band. And that was like my first conducting, even though it's like actually conducting, but more leadership in that role uh, position. And I really enjoyed kind of just bringing people together with music and with the idea of bringing parts from different sections and different people's ideas together to create this cohesive and just large work um, that other people could enjoy and listen to. And, you know, and from there it kind of just stemmed into like continuing and trying to actually hone in technique and all of that. And now I'm here, you know, trying to share that with more people in a new space. What drives you now? Ooh. What drives me? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of what drives me is like representing not just myself, but like a group of people that look like me and maybe think like I do and being able to share those ideas more widely, um, especially because, I mean, just want to say happy Black History Month because um, it is that month. Mm. And like, we're able to share our ideas like Black people more widely than we were able to decades ago. And we still have a ways to go, but I, I'd like to be a part of that. And I think music is the, the outlet for me. Cool. Thanks, Brittany. Andres. And, and what are you drinking today, Brittany? Oh, <laughs> oh right. It's our drink of the day. Um, my drink is a new Moscato. It's a Jacob's Creek, which is 
probably from California, as a lot of uh, wines or cheaper <laughs> wines are. But I saw the bottle label and I was like, this is really pretty. It reminds me of the Christmas tree mm. um, and just the colors and the little circles. So I got it. And it tastes pretty good. It's not super sweet, which I'm really glad about. Yeah. Mm. I have definitely experienced that with mus Moscato's Moscati. Probably. I'll discuss that. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, and then Andres, like, like why music for you? You're a composer, administrator, educator. I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, composer, yeah, f emphasis on the on the poser at times, but no. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> I I feel like I just kind of repeatedly fell into music. Um, like I took. Uh, piano lessons starting like really kind of halfway through second grade because I we were at some relative's house and I started picking like trying to pick out some Christmas song on the piano and my mom just kind of materialized next to me and was like do you want to take piano lessons um, and it was all downhill from there um, and then crazy story so my uh, middle school BFF um, his mom and his grandpa got together to start a music notation software. Um, so like y'all probably know Sibelius and Finale. Um, I don't know if y'all know Notion. Um, yeah, so it was called Notion and little eighth grade me, they were like, well, you, you like music. Do you wanna take this for a spin? Um, so I was like, absolutely. And it was like the coolest video game for a 13 year old. Um, and then it was really downhill from there. Um, but yeah, I, I just really enjoy the act of creating and um, especially co-creating, honestly, like working with other people. Um, like I know composing is usually this like theoretically lonely job, but I've been fortunate in that a lot of the things I've done have been with other people, like either writing things directly for a specific group of people or like doing a like short film soundtrack or something where you talk with the director a lot um, or like on Eureka stuff, there's a lot of times like working with the kids in Chelsea to, to like notate their ideas. Um, so yeah, that, that creative and especially co-creative process, I just find really fun and exciting. Well, and what drives you now? Um, also just side note, I, I found this photo of you today when I was looking for a <laughs> And it, I feel like it captures you oh, no. oh, perfectly no. from your past. <laughs> so I have to share this. Ah! Yeah. Oh my God, Mr. Suggs. Wait, where did you find this? Google Images, Andres. And this Whoa. look, wow. folks, this <laughs> look is the look I get from Andres every day. Oh, that's actually a really good example. Like, oh, oh, I'm, I'm remembering that picture now. So is that guy that I'm looking at, um, so, uh, so what drives me? I uh, really, um, community in a lot of ways drives me, which again is like perhaps antithetical to the idea of the composer as lone wolf. Um, but like um, that right there is, is me with my old middle school orchestra teacher, Mr. Suggs. Um, and I know it might be hard to tell, but I am not a middle schooler in that picture. Um, I was in college at that point, um, and oh. like Mr. Suggs and I, had, shut up, Christo. No, Mr. <laughs> Suggs and I had been uh, talking um, just about a bunch of things, and he asked if I could write a piece for his middle school, um, and like, and I did, and it was like really exciting for me to be able to write a piece for my former teacher, not my former school. He had moved schools at that point, um, but yeah, I think that's what was going on there. But yeah, so what drives you, you know? Uh, duh, what, a, what a hard question. I mean, a desire to create something new, but also a desire to share my voice and listen to other people's voices and get them to share theirs too. I love it. Wow. And what are um, you drinking? <laughs> I, uh, I was going to say, I've uh, like obviously had a, had a very different experience, but I uh, have also often found myself being like the only Latino 
in a space in, in this classical music world, um, which often manifests itself as my least favorite question ever. Uh, where are you from? No, where are you really from? Mm. Love it. Um, not as much though as I love this evening's rosé. Um, <laughs> it's an Artea rosé, I think. It was the cheapest rosé at Wegmans. Yes. Um, it's really good. I really like it. We love it. Musicians cheap and cheap alcohol mm -hmm. very well together. <laughs> Six fifty, well spent. Christo, wow. who are you? That's a question I ask myself every morning. <laughs> First thing I do when I get up in the morning. No, um, <laughs> so I'm a conductor, which you both unfortunately know. <laughs> um, and I, I've been obsessed with conducting since I was about 10 when I saw the BSO for the first time. Like chronologically 10, right? Because maturity wise, you're still there. Well, I, I think something probably got stuck psychologically <sighs> at that point, Andres, and I still feel like got that it. kid. But I, I remember I went, we went to a, um, see an all Beethoven concert at the Boston Symphony and they were doing Emperor Piano Concerto, Egmont and uh, Beethoven V. And wow, that is a staple. It, it was incredible. <laughs> was With Daniel Barenboim playing, playing the concerto. Oh my God, that's oh, so wow. And so I don't wow. really remember the first half. I probably slept through it. But I, there is this, I literally can just picture myself there. there uh, at intermission, and you know how it, it is during intermission, there's all the cacophony of people talking, catching up about their weeks, the lights are on, and musicians are warming up on stage quite violently sometimes. I just remember just the loudness and like the clashing of sound. And I remember this moment where the lights just turn off, everybody shuts up, the musicians calm down, they, they do this weird tuning thing. And then this uh, chubby old man, <laughs> comes out from the back of the stage, walks in front, everybody starts applauding, takes a bow, James Levine, by the way, um, uh, looks at like both in his left and right side, violins were split. And he just does like this one, bam, and Beethoven five just started. It was one of the largest sounds and it shocked the hell out of me. <laughs> and I literally told my parents, whatever that guy is having is what I have to have. <laughs> And I sometimes feel like I'm just still chasing that, um, that experience. And it, I don't know what it was, but it, that moment launched the kind of whole adventure in music. Um, and I, I think I took my first piano lessons officially when I was 14 and, and then enrolled at NEC prep. And I started studying conducting there and then composition and just started shooting up like a rocket ship. I conducted my first orchestra when I was 16. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's an, I still feel 10. It's literally the truest statement. I feel, I mean, I guess you guys knew that well <laughs> enough. And I, I guess I would say um, that it's all informed from family and wanting to be a part of something that's larger than one person could ever be, or even a group could be, and helping people to realize that they can be a part of something larger than themselves. And it can sound <laughs> awesome, like the start of the Beethoven Fifth. And my, my grandfather was a musician um, in communist Albania, which, you know, you know the story. Um, and he went to prison for eight years for playing music and his brother was executed for playing music just because it wasn't part of the culture or it was Western propaganda. Mm -hmm. And I always grew, I grew up with that grandfather and I always grew up with this idea of music being this terrifying and powerful thing to, to the degree that a government would go to such a length to quell it. So I have this, incredible reverence for our art form because it has that power to bring people together, I guess, to protest in, in <laughs> this case. Um, but yeah, I, I do, I have more stories, but I can share them at a later point. Yeah, it's kind of wild though, like how, how many, how often uh, throughout history governments, I mean, 
control art generally, but music in particular, this like invisible thing. Well, it has and no borders. Yeah. Still yeah. trying to, yeah. One of my favorite anecdotes is, you know, the 12 year old girl in Japan who starts crying when she did realize that Mozart is in Japanese, had no, has no idea, you know? Because you don't grow up with that kind of image when you just hear the music. Everything comes later. No, um, that's like totally true. Like me, when I was younger and listening to music, I've been involved with this style since as long as I can remember. And I just remember like envisioning things and like the people in the orchestra didn't come to mind. You know, at first it was like, oh, I know this instrument and I know this instrument and I know that they create this sound and this timbre and that's what's happening. It wasn't until I was like growing older and seeing these ensembles like in person and it, like the sounds personified and I was able to just say, oh, like this is what's happening now. I can envision like actual orchestras and whatnot. But like when I was younger, it was like just instruments or just sounds, like, mm. you know? It's amazing how like your brain just takes that all in. <laughs> mm -hmm. I remember when, when we, we, I came to the US when I was six and uh, my parents, no, no one spoke English. <laughs> we came with nothing. My mom built a, a life for us here. And I remember they, my, my parents put me in school, not at like special education or anything like that, just in a classroom, in an American classroom. And I sat there for two years and slowly gibberish became English. <laughs> I remember that feeling of just sitting in a room and having no idea what's going, it's kind of like being 10 at intermission, but having no idea what's going on, what people are doing. I remember not being able to say no, because I had no idea. Um, and, but it just slowly just came alive. Hmm. Uh, and what, what a thrilling thing to like, it, music is a, la a language in that kind of way, right, Brittany? Yeah, it is a language that, uh, not necessarily universal. Maybe we can talk about that another time. Ooh, I but... love that topic, yes. <laughs> well, so I, I always like to think, you know, people say music is a kind of language. I always like to think it's the other way around, that language is a kind of music, if that it fits into that hmm. larger umbrella, because of the way, the intonation that people use, the phrasing, the timing. You know, when you hear a great speech, it like can freeze time in very much the same way that a piece can. Uh, so like a, like a good morning versus good morning. That was good morning over text with an exclamation point versus good morning over text with a period. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> well, like, and I guess the modern interpretations of classical music and the way the field has evolved kind of bring that to light, don't you think? because the definition of what's music has expanded so much. Yeah. Yeah. Like you could literally have just a spoken text. Classic. Yeah, no, for sure. I remember um, when I was, oh, I was on Zoom. Uh, when I was uh, uh, teaching music history at, at Austin Arts Academy, we would talk a lot uh, at one point about the the globalization of music and kind of how technology has made it so we have access to all of the music all of the time, um, which has weird and crazy impacts on new music. Hmm. Wow. Tell us more about your maybe that's, teaching. That's, what? Tell us more about your teaching, Andres. Oh, yeah. Um, I taught at Boston Arts Academy for uh, a little bit over six years. Um, taught every subject under the sun. <laughs> Um, cause I actually joined as a, as a long-term substitute and then begged my way into staying on cause, cause that place is awesome. Um, ended up teaching, uh, music history and music theory for, and creative writing. Don't ask long story. Um, <laughs> for most of the time I was there. Um, but occasionally other things like several flavors of Spanish, um, which, you know, this is one of those things where the, the thinking is usually like, well, you know, you, you speak Spanish, you're fluent in Spanish, therefore you can teach it, right? False. Yep. I don't know how it works. <laughs> like, I can talk it, but- Yeah, I don't there's know a lot of grammar. That it's the same we'll for me with Albanian. Yeah, exactly. Yep, there you go. And this is why you don't teach Albanian in high school. 
<laughs> no, I always tell people I speak it secondhand, you know, like secondhand smoking. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, that's, that sounds accurate. But like it, to get back to the, just the definition of music and how it's expanded, because we're, you know, the topic for today in the sense is music for our time and specifically classical music, right? Yeah. So what, what would you say about the state of classical music in the modern world, folks? Uh, <laughs> this before COVID, like, oh, okay. Let's, let's, okay. Let's, <laughs> right. let's keep outside of the let's, pandemic for a second. And yes, let's just like, hit one issue at a time. Uh, um, I would say it's definitely, I don't want to just say like changing. I mean, it's obviously changing, you know, it's always changing, but it's taking a, a hard left, I would say, um, in that a lot of people are recognizing the connection that music needs to make with community, as Andres already mentioned, um, and that I think more people are realizing that it should be more accessible um, because you know it, it needs to be widespread. We need to expand the audience. We don't want, like there's the whole um, notion is classical music dying. I mean, I don't think so. I think it's transforming, but if you're not you know, reaching out to the audience that we have, yeah, it'll die. <laughs> just, to, <laughs> just to put it frankly, what do, yeah. what do you think the audience is dying? What, like, I think it's a question of relevance, right? Because especially before the internet, going into any kind of live event is a, was a big deal and a, like a huge part of everybody's daily lives. And the mm -hmm. thing about classical music um, and the whole audience dying thing in, in my mind has always been about the fact that just general attendance at anything in person has gone down again pre-covid definitely gone down during covid <laughs> but um, I, I would hope that's so. a zero. <laughs> because you know classical music at its best is experienced in person because like the space the people every like the acoustic changes based on how much you know wool coats are in the audience can literally affect the sound if you if if you have a sensitive enough or a tuned enough ear and experience and so like that has always made it unique for me like just taking it in the space but we live in a digital tech world so how do you recreate that um over the internet you kind of can't i mean now covid kind of proves that <laughs> you really can't um and so i've always thought how do we find what makes classical music relevant in the face of that, like as a an, as an access point to encouraging and inviting people to come more in concert, in, in person. Yeah. yeah, I think one thing I find really interesting with this is how much of of classical music and the classical music experience is not steeped in tradition necessarily, but looks like it's steeped in tradition. Um, and like two, two examples that I can think of that are, um, I think be, before our October event, I was talking to Patricia Willing and Sharon Sue, um, who we will talk about again in the future because they're doing some really cool work for us very soon. Um, an orchestration of a Fanny Mendelssohn piano sonata. Uh, see you for that in like a month and a half. Um, but they, um, we were talking about how uh, there's this discovery of the fact that women too, gasp, can be composers. And it happens every like 20 or 30 years, like in 1900 uh, or 1910, people were teaching in conservatories like, oh, well, yes, Amy Beach composes, but uh, like she's, she's the first woman composer really. And then like in the 70s and the 80s, then the, the same classes were being like, oh, well, yes, Joan Tower now exists. But like before her, there weren't really women composers. Um, and like there is this, again, like of, of a facade of this tradition that really it's, a, it's white men writing classical music when like actually like women have been writing this forever. Like you can, you can hit up Hildegard or Cassiano. Exactly. Like yeah. eight something. 
um, like 800 something, not 1800 something. Um, and like another one that comes to mind, maybe a smaller thing, but like the, cla the no clapping between movements thing. Um, like that actually was not a thing in the 1800s. Like yeah. you could clap, ex yeah, like, but- People so, talked, but, people would right. like chit chat like during the music and drink right. and, and yeah. And like, not that one or the other is necessarily inherently better. Like I can see arguments for both, but like there's this kind of tacit understanding that this is, you don't clap between movements and that's the way it's always been. And like, it hasn't always been that way. Well, I feel like we, we suffer from that kind of uh, amnesia. I, I just remember, I, I, you know, I did my undergrad in composition and there was a whole cohort of composers uh, that basically you, you'd ask them, when does music begin? Like, when does classical music begin? And it's like John Cage on, like, I've literally heard multiple times, mm. maybe these, these guys have changed their minds since undergrad. <laughs> I hope so. That like I remember a friend saying, um, "Oh, nothing, nothing matters before John Cage." And what? You you know, just the shock of that, just like almost <laughs> intentional amnesia. Like Mahler set the that standard. By choice? <laughs> yeah, that's honestly, I'm like, if that's by it's choice, a, it was intentional I don't, I don't... Like, to one degree, right? Yeah. But it's also like, there's like this <laughs> confidence that you get that just you take for granted what comes before you, right? Mm. It, it, it's, it's really easy to, to get what, what the tradition is in this incredibly distilled um, way, format in which, you know, unless you go digging for like Hildegard von Biggen, it's not easy to come across your music, right? Yeah. So you or kind of give up on the past based off what you learn in like boilerplate Music yeah, music like we, we were talking about this earlier, but like Chevalier, who lived at the same time as Mozart, and I didn't know about him until after college. <laughs> like, what? Yeah, yeah. that's what that's I mean, what I learned about him. That's what makes delving into, into the tradition so exciting and why we have all these like sects in classical music that focus on very specific eras. Because mm. if you like spent 15 minutes inside, like thinking more than like the top four composers from an era you start discovering a lot of new music right that you've never heard before there's always like this newness because there's so much music that's just not played mm. and, and like it's so refreshing I don't know I, I just remember that attitude of like just ignoring pre-John Cage <laughs> And moving on, it reminds me, uh, you know, Mahler was the conductor who set the tradition for not clapping in the hall. If, mm, I don't know if that you makes know. sense. I, I he, do, was, but he, was, he was vicious about it. There were these caricatures so in the newspaper. <laughs> he would literally, in the middle of a concert with the bright red face, stare back behind him at the audience until they, like, shut up. He very much started that cultural artifact, which now... Mm. I feel his glare. <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> uh, I said that's so Gustav. <laughs> right. <laughs> Truly. Is. It's a little tyrannical, right? Oh, and so, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's like what happens when you academicize something, right? You start to bleed the fun out of it. <laughs> and I think that's that's a really interesting point. There is like we, like music is this ethereal, invisible thing. Um, but it also all exists in and comes out of a context. Um, and like, I think, I think there, there's a, a, a way of thinking where putting it into that context or acknowledging that context can make it feel less magical than you want it to feel. Um, but like, I would almost think the opposite, right? Like it opens up so many more avenues for understanding it and thinking about it. Brittany, what do you think? I would I would agree in saying that, um, especially just the more that I learn about music and within a social context, rather than just like it in and of itself, just absolute, it means that much more to me. Like knowing whether positively or negatively or whatever, it means that much more. I'm getting to see mediumly. how, yes, mediumly, <laughs> in which, in however, 
uh, affect it does. It's just, it's just great to know about music in just different, like in, in different ways that it reflects other things and connects to other things. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I totally agree. I, I think like the role of classical music in like you hit the nail on the head where is it the nail on the head exactly yes with the idea of just where you hit the nail. How, how it thank you andres <laughs> um with how music fits within its context what andre said but also as you said within the community and like the more social aspect of it um like i've always thought the the beautiful thing about an orchestra is that it it is a little representation of how a community should work or could work well together because you have fundamentally different instruments playing very different parts at times that clash but it's in concert literally it has to work together like the trumpet has to listen to the viola <laughs> to plan and make solve most problems like when you're conducting in rehearsal most of the problems can be solved by just telling people to listen to each other right and it's like holy crap most of the problems in society could be solved if you <laughs> two people to listen to each other yeah. instead of make assumptions and let trumpet players be trumpet players and violists be violists right mm -hmm. and so like i i always think we're we're so like uh, we take it for granted the tradition we come from and like what music is about because we play at such a high level and we've come to expect that high level because of technology to link it back to that like i i understand i talk about this kind of constantly but i always think classical music suffers from what i call the oreo cookie problem you know it's like as modern day consumers you want every oreo cookie to taste the same you don't want one Oreo cookie to taste great and the next one to <laughs> taste terrible, right? You want to down the whole box of Oreo cookies after that like horrid breakup. <laughs> I mean, unless you sign up for one of those like weird confetti flavored Oreo cookies, in which case you're on your own. You made that well, well, but, I feel like but point taken. <laughs> but like music is the same way. It's like you when, especially because of how recording works, you mm -hmm. want to hear that Bach, uh, whatever, Partita, if you're a violinist played very consistently right same with orchestras and so you like in order to do that you fit the more unique elements the more fun elements into a very rigid box mm -hmm. um, and it's it's time to get out of that box and i That's what eureka's been about right yeah. yeah and i think that that getting out of the box and the the community work and the partnerships that we set up are, are going to be a, a great topic for for a future strike a chord a future stricken chord um stricken chord. that sounds like a sickness i was struck with a chord <laughs> i was struck with a chord my mother oh, struck me with a chord that that's <laughs> what i was thinking <laughs> it was an oh, man. Chord. <laughs> oh okay oh, oh the agony <laughs> diminished is so dark uh, Jeez. oh i i love that to start <laughs> can only go up from there honestly thank you thank or you for out. setting us up for success <laughs> you got it <laughs> shall we talk just a little bit about eureka and the mission that we've tried to set forth in this ensemble um before we wrap up and why and then we'll share our, our calendar yeah exactly but then what brought the three of us oh, together yes. um and has kept us together somehow at least this year <laughs> um andres i i would ask you to lead it zoom has kept us andres together. is our executive director folks yes yes and if you didn't know uh, that Brittany's our amazing assistant conductor um <laughs> i i would love to answer that question um what was it <laughs> what are we doing with eureka yes so great so i'm a uh, conductor my job is to confuse musicians <laughs> you do it very successfully well thank you <laughs> um, so at eureka ensemble we nurture social impact through music um and for me that breaks up into three parts uh so through music 
obviously we're musicians. Uh, we uh, mostly work with classical music, but we adapt depending on what the situation calls for and depending on what community we're working with. Um, and it's because we all, as we've been discussing this whole time, really believe in the power of music to uh, bring people together, to provoke people, honestly, and to, to, to get people uh, really feeling uh, deeply uh, in a way that allows them to, to connect in a way that other things just, just can't. Um, uh, social impact. Every project that we do has some kind of issue or cause that we work around, work with, work to address or highlight. Um, and the way we do that is nurture. We work with experts who are already doing this kind of work in the community. Rather than just us assuming we know everything, we will work with a community organization, we will partner with a community organization who might already be doing the work um, around that specific issue. Um, I, I could give many examples, but I, I will stop myself there and, and give examples at some other time, or let one of y'all if you wanna give, give one. Brittany, why don't you dig into it? Um, Social sure. impact through music, what the heck is that? Yeah, well, I mean, as Andres has been saying, you know, reflecting on what's going on in our community um, immediately and in by and large. And, you know, if you've been tuning in, we've had uh, programs in the past. In October, we had our program, We Shall Not Be Denied, which we talked about voting rights and kind of presented the history of all of that. Um, and that was a huge thing to just discuss. Um, partnered with the Voting Protection Corps um, to get information and also interviewed a lot of different experts, both on um, knowledge of the voting rights um, acts and all of the historical context of that, as well as just the, the music side of it as well. So we were able to bring those two together in the nurturing aspect that Andres was talking about. I'm so sorry to put you guys on the spot with difficult questions, but we're doing can, okay. Can I we answer? This, I'm going to answer. Five. I'm yeah. going to answer with a question. Oh, I love doing that. <laughs> oh my god! So, like, here's the question. You know, part of the whole package with Eureka Two is to try and present like high quality performances, right? And set that as the baseline. Like, do what every classical music group does, right? And then set that as a baseline for something much more. So my question is, why is it important for a musician to play in tune? <laughs> is this a real question? <laughs> I, I oh, mean, like, man. think about like mm -hmm. all our but colleagues. Is it, though? <laughs> well, think about all our. Okay, violist. It's not that you're playing out of tune; <laughs> but... it's that you're being expressive through your use of microtones. Yes. No, I cannot accept that. <laughs> Uniformity. No. But like, you know, I think about our colleagues who spend how many decades? How many how much have you practiced in your life, Brittany? All the various hours. I mean, not as of late, but I've played it for at but, least half of my life. Right. And like significant so a significant portion of your life has gone to sleep and practice. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Like, and I, I think about like my, <laughs> I hope you sleep and practice. No. Please, please sleep. No, but <laughs> Take care of yourself. Like, I, I think about my colleagues from conservatory who literally would practice eight hours a day and have been doing that since they were like six years old. And like, that's what that, I'm basically asking the question to that person like, why? Why? Why is it important to play in tune, oh, violinist? <laughs> and then I, if I can like answer it, at least from my side, yeah, you know, I think about what Women's Chorus is about, which is a program that uh, Eureka started for women experiencing homelessness in Boston, women homelessness and poverty. Um, and it, the ladies from all these various shelters, uh, Andres, what, what are the numbers? We've worked with over a hundred women uh, in the yeah. last couple of years. Ages 17 to 82. 
17 to 82 from every possible uh, background of mental health, economic status that you can imagine, and very diverse as well. And so these ladies come to a weekly rehearsal and then also get private, free private lessons with trained vocalists. And so I, I think about what it means to play in tune when you see these amazing women work really hard at learning to sing a song together with the chorus and then part of an orchestra. And like when you think about one of the biggest problems living with homelessness um, in your life is a problem of neglect. Like, I don't know if you know what being in the shelter system is like, but you have to pick up your life most of the time, every single day. That includes getting your healthcare set with an advocate every day, finding you hardly ever get the chance to wake up and go to sleep in the same bed every day. So you have to find the shelter to get a lottery ticket and be assigned a bed. Every and if day. even and if you find that, the, it's for like two weeks max. That if most of them are just one night, and yeah. there are some one week, two week, yeah, lottery tickets, and then like you're basically working really hard to stay homeless, <laughs> like to just maintain what mm. what like some kind of consistency and it's you're working really hard all you get very much so from most other people is neglect and like feeling worthless and like, like things you never want to do so to translate that when you're working on a bloody song trying <laughs> to sing you know syllables together and in tune and then give a concert that receives ridiculous amount of adoration and flowers and appreciation from the very people who literally ignore you every day is incredible. That's so like that's why you sing in tune, right? It's just for for classical musicians, we we kind of lose sight of that by being so involved in the details <laughs> for decades. That we forget that that's the, that's why it's important to to play a high, really high quality performance and provide that. Every, anyone can tell anybody who's even never heard a musician before can tell if it's a high quality player. There's something like, about the like the extra dimension of what they're doing in front of you that brings you there, right? You know, in an, in an orchestra, in, in focusing on yourself and kind of your your voice through your instruments, so to speak, it allows you to to well, talk to others. Andres, as a conductor, I have no idea but what it means to focus on myself. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> but like, yeah, sorry, Andres, you're saying. Yeah, just that, that, that allowing, like, uh, caring for yourself in that way, like, focusing on your voice, cultivating that voice, being in tune, allows you to be a better member of the community of the orchestra to work with these other instruments sharing their voices too. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's what you, the Eureka mission, the whole idea of social impact through music is about both on the side of the musicians, giving our professional musicians um, like the resources to be able to do that kind of work and work with different kind of different community members and like work on bringing people into a concert hall, like very actively. And then also for the community um, and our all our different partners. I wanna hear more from Brittany. I always wanna hear more from Brittany. Every time we talk, Brittany, I always I mean, like steal the spotlight. I'm so oh, sorry. Oh no, mm -hmm. no, you, you Just, say a lot of thoughtful, profound things. But I mean, I don't know if Andres maybe wants me to kind of share what's coming up next on yeah. the Eureka calendar. Um, yeah, so later this month, we're having a, um, what's the title of the world? Uh, the, uh, the world <laughs> at home. <laughs> it's like, what's the title of the concert that I basically programmed? <laughs> right. I was going to say, like, <laughs> you and Alan have been the ones on this. Yes, um, the world at home, um, in which we are showcasing works um, by composers from, I believe, four different continents, six different countries, that spans two or three different, like, centuries it's it's gonna be great it's gonna be fantastic 
we'll have the date out for sure. It's later this month. Tune in. Um, it'll be string quartet pieces, and they're they're all great. I've I've handpicked all the movements, so <laughs> you can you can take it from me. Um, and then following that, Andres, what do we have? Um, I will note on that concert our. Uh, one of our board members and one of the co-founders, Alan Toda Umbras, was also working with Brittany. Like it's, it's the Brittany and Alan show for that one. So I'm very excited. Um, then in March, uh, towards the back half of March, we are going to have a special session uh, to the project I mentioned earlier, focusing on Fanny Mendelssohn uh, and her life and her piano sonata that we are commissioning to turn into a concerto. And Christo, can you tell us about our last big event this spring? We have so many. Which one do you want Rising to Rising Tides. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> the Eureka formula. Well, and also just on the Fanny Mendelssohn thing, I just, can you just explain that a little, what it, what it, why it's significant that sure. we're orchestrating this? Because I'll, give, I'll give the short spiel of it because I really want to give this the time that it's due because it's, it's an awesome story. Um, but in short, Fanny Mendelssohn, back in the day, uh, uh, she, some of you may know her as sister of Felix Mendelssohn, um, but she was a composer in her own right, and she mostly wrote for piano, um, partly probably because she was really good at it, but also because there was, of course, the prevailing notion then that women should not be writing for orchestras, and if they did, their music wouldn't get played. So we actually have very few orchestral pieces from Fanny Mendelssohn. Um, and this piano sonata of hers um, in G minor um, kind of sounds concerto-like and it seems highly plausible that she intended it to be a concerto, not a sonata, but because she was not gonna be able to get an access to an orchestra, wrote it as a sonata. So a lot more details in that story how we came to this conclusion, how we came to commission this piece from the people we commissioned it from in a future episode. So thank, thank you. Andres. That's yeah. how you Well, it's all right. about writing a wrong, right? And yes. Like we said about our mission in just supporting musicians and giving them the resources, right? Empowering them. We can do that with composers from the past too, right? Mahler added eight horns to Beethoven seven. Oh my God. God. Have you ever seen the Mahler orchestrations? I, I, I have not. <gasps> I it's I... frightening. <laughs> Beethoven 9. Oh, boy. Oh, oh God, just no. very quick. Beethoven 5, in the end of the first movement, where the the huge motive comes back. Ba, 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 mm -hmm. The last time. Ba, 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 Mahler literally wrote a scissora. So you, if you conduct it the way he wrote it, it's ba, ba, ba. <laughs> ba, ba, ba. God. Oh, it's ridiculous, right? So it's we're not doing that, folks. Don't worry. <laughs> right. The rising tides. It's it's our like capital project this year. It's a multi-year collaboration that we're doing with other local institutions, both music and otherwise. Uh, typically, a uh, big Eureka project uh, works like this. We have a formula. We pick a cause that the local community is facing, partner with the organizations that are invested directly in resolving, addressing that cause, and then create a way to use music to, to help, to support, to address that cause. Um, Rising Tides is, the cause is one of the smallest causes, it's climate change. <laughs> it affects very few people and will affect very few people. <laughs> No, so it's like the defining issue for our entire generation for communities everywhere. And so Eureka has been thinking, what can we do at the local level to um, you know, do our part as stewards of our environment and get involved? And so we've partnered with a few local institutions, which I will not share yet just because that's for future endeavors. Um, and actually, Andres, since you'll be working really closely with our fellows, I would want you to actually talk about them. So our thinking here is uh, climate change is most going to impact the younger generation, um, which 
I guess we're not super old ourselves, but the younger generation. So we're working with some, some young composers, singer songwriters um, to create music that addresses the impacts of climate change on the local community. Because we also believe that um, being such a gigantic issue, it only makes sense for us to focus on the local impacts to make, make it real for people um, and like focus on, on just environmental justice in the Boston area. Um, and yeah, more details forthcoming, but it, it, I'm very, very excited. I was actually talking to a couple of the young composers earlier today. And our tagline is catchy. It's the oceans are rising and so are we. Right? It's because we've been sitting all day. So now we have to, we have to rise. Yeah. Well, and then in every, the idea is that we start uh, with virtual programming every year it grows, right? And at, at, at one point when we can do in-person things again, we'll throw a large scale orchestral performance. Um, for the community, should probably a series of them. But I don't want to share too much yet. We'll save it for another time. Yes. Um, which brings us to the end of our current calendar. We will share more events as we have them. As everybody knows, it's been a weird year, which means it's also weird for us in scheduling things. We kind of got to change things all the time, depending on restrictions or if someone was exposed or like all kinds of fun things. Um, but check back here, uh, check on our Facebook page, like us on Facebook, follow and subscribe. I think that's what we're supposed to say. Yes. Yeah. Follow I think that the right thing to say is donate. <laughs> <laughs> donate if you feel we, so moved, you all we things. will accept. <laughs> and get involved. Um, you know, We want yeah. everybody to be involved in the work that we're doing to whatever degree makes sense. A lot of the time, just donating whatever cup of coffee is the worth <laughs> of money you were gonna spend is is great. Most people can do that. Mm, Get yeah. involved um, and help And if you have ideas, yeah. if you have ideas for future things you'd like to see us discuss here, drop them in the comments. Uh, we're definitely looking for those or if any guests that you think we should have on because we are gonna start having guests after tonight as well. So it's something I'm very excited about. Yeah. And yeah. the thing about strike a strike a chord is as you can tell, we are new at this. We're gonna find our online media personalities in, in, in soon, right? Um, and the idea we're developing be, them because we don't really have offline personalities, we're just making them up as we go. You guys speak for yourselves. <laughs> Oof. we have a, a series of really cool guests um that we're lining up and can't wait to talk to them and share it with you guys yeah and Brittany, you're awesome andres oh, awesome. you're okay <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> christo christo you're acceptable <laughs> wow that's a compliment <laughs> I, I love you guys. Talk to you again soon. Next time we do this. Yeah. yeah. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you guys for tuning in.